All right, all right. Welcome, welcome to Full Spectrum, Why Color and Comics Matter. Thank you for coming, thank you for being here with us. Uh, before we get introduced to this lovely panelist, um, this lovely panel, excuse me, this lovely panel, uh, I just want to do a quick video. We've pretty much been doing this uh, for the last two years, and uh, the content hasn't changed as much, but the dynamics and you know the focus of what we're trying to do in the industry is. And what we're looking to do is make sure that our representation matters. And when we talk about representation, we're going to get into that with the presentation. My name is Anasi Gifted. Uh, I'm going to introduce the panelists in one second. Uh, I have a quick, quick video that I want to um, display. Um, and then uh, we're going to get right into it, all right? like for you guys to give my panelists a big round of applause real quick yeah. as we begin to introduce to my right to my right in the lime green we have Michelin Hess give it up for Michelin yeah. uh, to her right we have Royal Coupe yeah. he's going to tell you about his product to his right we have the blue girl Give it up for the little girl. And we have to her right, uh, Regine Sawyer. Yeah. And to her right, we have Chuck Collins. Give it up for Chuck Collins. Yeah. We have a diverse group of panelists here. And um, basically, what we're going to be looking at is, you know, answering the question, why does 
color and comics matter, right? So when we look at that, we're going to start off with our first question, and uh, we have uh, the panelists introduce themselves. Just on a housekeeping thing, we have this, uh, anytime we are talking about Marvel, DC, uh, and Image, I would say, um, we're going to be like, oh, the other guys, right? Because they, they, they're going to be referenced to it. So I'm going to just give, we're going to go, we're going to go through this. So this is the audience participation piece, right? So this is how we go. Uh, so we know the new Black Panther is coming out by uh, Marvel. Oh, the other guys. Okay, yeah, all right, so, so let's bring it back again. So, we know that the new Black Panther is coming out February 2018. Oh, the other guys. guys. Uh, yeah, the other guys, because we're going to be talking about mainly independent uh, uh, comic book creators and everything here, but we're going to be talking about diversity in a sense, too. Uh, if you didn't notice, we do have this being fed live. If you uh, use a hashtag, full spectrum, why color? Uh, I know it's very long, but when I did full spectrum, that was already taken, so we couldn't do use that one. So uh, please understand that you know we we look to do that. All right, so just uh, starting off with the panelists, um, why do you think it's important to see more diversity in comics? Uh, anyone could kind of grab that, and uh, we'll start the panel discussion from there. Okay, because <laughs> Ray hit me. I'm going first. <laughs> um, I don't call it diversity, for those of you who follow my blog, blurgirl.com, I call it reality, because everybody else calls it diversity, because when they look outside, that's not what they see. I live in Brooklyn, so. Um, I also, uh, we're saying color comics matters, but it's really this inclusive, uh, we're not just saying just black people in comics matters. It's um, LGBTQ, it's disabled, it's, you know, you know what I mean? We're, we're, we're at the point now that we are seeing enough independent comics and independent artists creating work, and it's not just superhero comics, there's also other stories being told, that there are other stories that you can now um, support, as opposed to just waiting for the other guys um, uh, to give quality, uh, quality work that you can purchase. He introduced me. He did that part. <laughs> Here. But you, you can go into more detail. I didn't get into what um, you do. <laughs> Roy wants to introduce himself. Whatever. Um, my name is Roy Okupe, and um, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Unique Studios. I have written um, four graphic novels now, EXO, The Legend of Wally Williams, Part 1 and Part 2, um, I Like a Warrior Queen, Part 1, and The Windmaker. And uh, just to add to what she said, I think another important aspect of diversity is also the people producing the comics, not just the characters. So behind the scenes, the, the writers, the artists. I think um, um, I was I, I was born and raised in Lagos, Nigeria. So I, I spent the first 16 years uh, of my life growing up in Lagos, and um, I've been lucky enough to spend the other 16 years of my life growing up here in the United States. So I, I kind of have a best of both worlds approach too. Uh, things that I've seen back home and uh, things that I've seen here and um, you know creating being able to uh, my first I would say foray into American culture was through comics and animation that's how you know by watching Spider-Man and the X-Men I was able to see New York and see what American culture was was like and for me um, I'm kind of like doing the same thing with my books where I create these stories these fantasy stories the superhero stories that are inspired by, influenced by African culture, and a lot of people are able to assimilate that because a lot of times when you hear about Nigeria or African news, it's not always <laughs> great stuff. It's either the poverty or you know, corruption or whatever the case may be. And, and, and those things are important to highlight, but there's, there's a huge side of Africa that you don't get to see every day. And um, you know, I, try to, um, I try to convey that through my book, through my books and through entertainment. So I do feel like diversity um, it's also important for the people that are any editors and producers, directors, and things like that. Like having people in that position um, brings an additional level of authenticity to whatever work that they may be producing. Hi, uh, my name is Michelle Ness. I'm the uh, writer and uh, illustrator of Mouse and Otherland, and I think it's important because as a kid, um, I used to tag along with my brother when we were in Flatbush, and we would go to this candy store on the corner for comics, and there were just never really any comics with characters that looked like me. And I think it's really important, particularly for young children, to see themselves mirrored back at them 
in the kind of adventures and stories that are being told because it lets them know that they can actually visualize themselves in those adventures and it even creates a kind of permission that um, has them thinking about creating their own stories not thinking there's just this kind of barrier there where they're only kind of viewing what other people are doing and can't really see themselves as an active participant. Hi, I'm Jean. <laughs> um, I'm the owner, creator of Lock It Down Productions and um, coordinator founder of the Women in Comics Collective International. Um, for me, on the creator's side, um, as the founder of Women in Comics, it was just so interesting to meet so many women, particularly women of color, um, that were in comics and a lot of them didn't know each other. Like around the time that Women in Comics started, we, we started gathering more and more members like, oh, you exist? You exist? Oh my god, we exist! Oh my god, it's not just me somewhere in my room just writing a story or drawing. There's another aspect, there's a community out there. Like we can commiserate, we can talk, we can fight the system even. We can do all those things and it was just so special for all of us to see that we are all in this together and it was important for us to come together and work together and that's why we go into the community, we do workshops. We do panel discussions. We have our own Comic Con in the Bronx. And it gives us a chance not only for us to say it between each other, but then to say to others, like, yes, if you're a woman, if you're if you're a young girl and you're interested in comics, like, yes, you can do this. Just because you're drawing doesn't mean someone else isn't drawing. If you're writing, someone else isn't writing. Like we like we're we're here. We're definitely here. And I always like to say we're not going anywhere. Okay. How you doing, y'all? My name is Chuck Collins. Um, former bouncer, now turned webcomic artist. Um, I do a little webcomic called Bounce, which is pretty much about my life working as a bouncer in New York City. So, yeah, much like the way Blurred Girl says that I believe that diversity is just real life. I mean, I, in all honesty, I don't like the word at all because when you go out to the train, you go out to the club, you go out to a bar, you go out to the coffee shop, you see people of all different spectrums, and everybody in those uh, particular places has a life and a bundle of experiences that have made them who they are right now. And as opposed to like a certain, and, and across the spectrum of, of uh, entertainment, when it comes to music, when it comes to comics, movies, it seems that every other uh, ethnic group has become a joke to tell a certain story like, we need the cool black guy to say this thing, or we need the magical Negro, or we need the sassy Latina girl, or we need the Asian dude that knows all the math. And it becomes this joke to push forward a narrative that these guys are cool, but the main character, who's a mediocre character, is better than all these other people. And he learns from all these other people in order to become better than them. So, yeah, to me, making You're not comments, talking about Iron Fist, are you? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't mean I'm humans. I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> hey, I was I was I was gonna I was actually gonna wait. I was gonna wait until later to get to the shade, but I guess we're gonna start early. Let's do it. Um But uh I, I believe that, you know our jobs as creators, especially if we put out quality content, is to break that narrative, which is very upsetting and, and tiresome because why should I have to explain my existence as a human being on this world in order for you to understand that? Why should I have to fight for the fact that I need to be accepted into your narrative? I'll just make my own. That's just you know how I feel. So it's my take. Wow. So that, that kind of kind of ties into what does this ideal comic book world look like then? I mean, what does it look like? Just people creating. Just us creating, creating wonderful books that other people can enjoy, that mm -hmm. all of us can enjoy. And not be judged so much for like, oh my god, like there's a there's a lead film character, oh my god, there's a LGBTQ character. Like why can't we just exist and just enjoy the damn books? <laughs> It's like food. I mean, everybody in here eats, I'm assuming, at least once a day. At least. So you get a craving for something, and you go look for whatever that is. So there's enough content out there now to say, you know what, I, I, 
let's try reading this, or let's look at that. That actually does exist. Now, I'm not saying that we don't have to comment and, and actually talk to and start conversations when we are misrepresented or when um, characters are represented only in one way. But there, I think what's happened is the media sort of said, like, these are the only things, and you need to be railing against these two things. And then there's a lot of people that, and uh, independent creators that are being left out of conversations. Um, like, recently, actually, the, the, there, everybody knows about one of the other guys is doing a comic book featuring a Nigerian superhero. And they're like, this is the first time a Nigerian superhero has ever started a comic. Right, stairs in Africa. Here we go. Here we go. Stairs in Nigeria. Right, stairs in Yoruba. Like it doesn't mean. So they they were ignoring like an entire contingent of, of comic book creators, and there's a huge. You can speak to this. I've never been to Lagos. Yeah, and there's a whole con over here that speaks to. Yeah, um, I'm I'm gonna try not to throw any shade. I, I'm a nice. No <laughs> shade. No <laughs> shade. <laughs> um, yeah, it's interesting what she said. Um, I think. There's a lot of ignorance out there as well too, um, but I, I'm going to talk this, talk about this in, in from two angles, from the creator angle and also just the general public. Um, yes, when that happened, it was I mean it's kind of frustrating saying that oh this is the first time you see a Nigerian superhero, and I'm in the back here saying well, I've been doing this for about uh, three or four years now, but. Um, I, I think um, there's something you mentioned about, you know, it's just like food. Like a lot of times, a lot of people complain about their diversity. It's this oh, Marvel, excuse me, the other guys the other guy. aren't doing. Uh, they gotta let the audience do. Gotta let the audience. All right, gotta let them do. Um, uh, so it's it's a lot of people complain that the other guys don't produce a, a lot of diverse content. But I always challenge people that I mean, just just go online, just do a Google search. You would, you would see so many things that are being done by so many independent people and it's great content as well too so as much as she said it's correct for us to complain and challenge the status quo but at the same time there's also a responsibility to actually do your own research and actually go out there and find out what is it that other people are doing to actually satisfy uh, to actually um, you know, speak to this problem or, 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 or solve this issue and actually go out there and, and do research on, on your own as well but I also think the onus is on us too as well as creators like I was born and raised in Lagos Nigeria right and if, if I'm a writer and I have my own perspective growing up I need to put out that content there I can't wait for a Marvel or excuse me I can't wait for the other guys, <laughs> the guy, the other guys to do it you know I, the, the, you know there's also a responsibility to be able to tell my own story you know so it's more authentic as well too so I, I think um, there's there's blame to be laid on both sides. Uh, there's a responsibility as you know diverse creators going out there actually taking a chance on themselves and also audience members who are actually craving and asking for diversity take that extra step to be able to go out there and actually do a search or ask someone, oh, what what kind of comics can you recommend? Uh, I'm looking for something that takes place in Nigeria or Africa or Mexico or whatever the case may be. And these things are actually there out there. Hmm, that that kind of anybody else want to jump in on that before I move into the next question? Uh, um, I, like Chuck, Chuck I leaning guess, into it. Leaning <laughs> into it. <laughs> no, I mean, I, everybody, everything, everyone said is pretty much on point. I don't know, the only thing I can add is um, when it comes to the other guys, um, I can't wait for them to write a story that I will be able to identify with. It's pretty much like, you know, oh man, they need to have more black characters and do this thing and do that, or, or more women characters or whatever. It, it's kind of like me waiting for Frank Miller to write an autobiography of Fred Hampton. It's not oh, gonna come out like that. It's not. I, yes, exactly. <laughs> Deep. 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 What he's trying to say is, it's not in a lot of these companies. It's not in their best interest. No, to it's, do, and you're you're gonna be waiting forever. Yeah, it's basically what it is. Is it's it's a marketing scheme. It's it's what's hot right now, and this is what a lot of people understand with the whole business aspect of diversity. Well, um, we, we, that's, oh, that's sorry, ties right into the next okay. question. Ties right into the next oh, question. Oh, oh. So, so from a business standpoint, is it important for DC, Marvel, and Image, the other guys, the other guys yes, to diversify their comics? And then you could jump in right away. Oh, well, that's exactly the point I was going to get into. Like, all right, let's go back as far as uh, 
you know, in the 80s, you know, uh, Daredevil first came out, and I remember the early issues of Daredevil. He didn't really fight ninjas like that. In fact, the hand that you see on the TV series came way later on when Frank Miller started writing it, right? Now, if we remember what happened during that time, there was a big uh, movement towards indie comics. So one of the leading indie comics during the time was Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, oh, yeah. right? So and all, it's not the Saturday morning cartoon yeah. that half y'all in here remember. Somebody back there knows what I'm talking about. Yep. <laughs> it was it was it was black an white. adult comic. Right. It was black and white. <laughs> they they, they <laughs> all looked the same. Yeah. They I just have, thought it was violent. It no, was, it was very violent. Right. They didn't have like different color headbands. Nope. They, they killed Shredder be. and April O'Neil was black, but that's a whole other conversation. No, she was. No, no. no. She was. She, she had that kink going on. Yes. <laughs> Look back in the day. Kevin Eastman even will tell you. Yeah, we kind of. Yeah, but anyway. No, so, no <laughs> but if you remember, the original story in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was that the fact that the mutagen fell on them, and then they became the turtles. They tied into the same story that there was another person, a small kid, who got affected by it too. And that kid was supposed to be Daredevil because there was these huge Daredevil fans. Because you know the, the chemical falls on you know Matt and he goes blind and everything else. He, that's why he's able to do all the things he's got to do. All that being said, that's Marvel paying attention to the small guy because Kevin Eastman and Peter Lear weren't selling books like that, but they knew that there was a big movement towards the indie scene, and it's the same thing that goes on on Twitter. You have black Twitter, you have all these people talking about the, these different things, like comic books that we put out, and there's twi uh, Twitter blasts and hashtags out there. You don't think they pay attention to that? They pay attention to that and build their own business model based on what No, they absolutely already. pay attention to that. Yeah, they because really I, actually wrote a, I actually wrote a post, and some of y'all remember it. It was about Riri, and it was actually about some... Riri is the new black female Marvel Iron Man. Sorry, other guys. Um, <laughs> Well, right, but she was taking over from for, for Iron Man. Um, and basically, um, I was I, I was lamenting. I'm like, can we just get some new characters? Can we stop, you know? Recycling. Recycling. But for some reason, somebody all, every time there's a civil war, a black man has to die. And that was another problem I had. Because it was Giant Man last time, and this time it was Rhodey. And it was a little, I, I'm like, why? Why in every narrative, in every universe? Why, Morty? Why? <laughs> and everything works. Well, it's recycling. I mean, they're just yeah. going to, like, you know, take somebody else's suit and dust it off and then drop another character in there. Yeah. But, and then the, and the, I think the other big thing in terms of the business is, yes, everybody realizes, and it's very popular now to say diversity. They say, I have diverse characters, and I have this, and I have that, and check off all the boxes. But at the same time, you also have to take a closer look at what that diversity means. Now, I'll use Inhumans. Now, there's, there's many problems with Inhumans, the, the TV series. I'm not going to get into the technical. I'm not going to get into the writing. I'm not going to get into the a, right, a lace front that's tacky. I'm not getting into that. I'm getting into it. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to talk about the fact that it was also promoted as a diverse cast, and a lot of the characters that were white in the comics were changed over. OK, yay, we now have uh, you know, an Asian character. Who's a martial artist? <laughs> we now have a black character who has hooves for feet and is technically an animal. Right. So I'm not. So you also have to be careful when you're like, yay, we have. Let's just mark all the boxes. Okay, when you're looking at backstory and you're trying to paint things, there's, there's, you have to be very careful. And if there's nobody in the writers' room and there's nobody that is editing the comic, that is not just diverse, but, and I hate using that term, but not, is sensitive, because you have people, look, there's plenty of people that look like me that I don't agree with. So you also have to have people that are sensitive to the atmosphere and the climate, as well as the people that are being written about. Otherwise, you're gonna continue making mistakes, and that's how you have things like um, Confederate. Well, there's two black writers. I don't care. <laughs> I, I don't care. I don't like this. Well, no, but you can't say it's not diverse because we have people in the writer's room. I can still complain because I don't like the subject matter. And that's the part that people don't understand. No, 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 you can't. You must like this, but because we have people that look like you. They could be idiots. I don't care. And more disturbingly is why they're doing it. So, right. I mean, it's like, are they doing a confederate? It's like, well, was it just a case of like, oh, God, I have a great idea. <laughs> Same time, it's a part of 
what makes me feel like so many of these diverse characters that are out there are, have a, as, a kind of a disingenuous aspect to them because it's like, okay, we'll allow you to exist as long as you perform and people are buying you, but if we notice any dips or anything, we're not going to push it. Oh, yeah. We are going to kill kill off this character and do something else. And that's how you get the other guys legacy. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, the thing I like about the indie creators is because, you know, at the end, in a lot of cases, there's true love behind what people are doing. It's not like, I'm going to do this to get famous. It's like, I'm going to do this because it needs to be done, <laughs> because people need to see this. Oh, yeah, definitely. I know that, uh, and I'm going to just read off a couple of numbers for you and everything. Uh, and we have the, the top 150 uh, comics for July, right? And number one for July was uh, Dark Days, the cast, that's uh, Batman for those of you who don't know, uh, sold uh, 128,000 units. Um, Astonishing X-Men number one sold 122,000 units. Uh, Batman number 26 sold 107,000 units. Uh, number four was Batman, number 27, sold 102,000. This all July. Uh, the first book to feature a minority uh, lead, um, including women, you know, because uh, when, when we talk about it, we talk about Wonder Woman. Woman Wonder Woman was number uh, 29 with 43,000 uh, units sold. Uh, then we jump down, we get to Miss Marvel, 20,000 uh, units sold. She was at 108. Uh, Spawn uh, was um, number 115 uh, at 18,000 units, and then uh, Black Panther Crew, number four, was at 13,000, right? Uh, that's, that's July. Then we jump into August, we get uh, Dark Knight Metal, uh, issue number one sold uh, 261,000 units. Uh, number two was Batman, number 28, 104. Uh, number three was Batman 29, which had 100,000. Number four was uh, 80, uh, Secret Empire uh, with uh, 86,000 units. And then uh, beyond that, we have um, Wolverine and the all new Wolverine uh, with 85,000 units. And then, of course, with the first, you know, when we talk about minority or anything, uh, we get down to number 32 with Wonder Woman again with 41,000 units. Uh, Harley Quinn. 25 and 26. Uh, she was number 44 with uh, 39,000 units and 37,000 units. And then the all new Wolverine. Then uh, we have at 86 uh, Black Panther number 17 with 25,000 units. Uh, and and that, that's pretty much it. So just based on sales alone. Wait, I have a quick question. I just yes. want to quantify the sales a little bit. These are. The these, top. Right, but these are sales of not digital print, correct? Print. These okay, are print. and these are based on what was ordered versus what was sold. No, these are sales. Supposedly. The actual sales. Okay. The actual sales. Okay. So, just based on sales alone, does this justify the large publishers <coughs> a reason not to diversify their market? How does the panelists feel about that? Well, it can actually be a little bit confusing because basically you you mentioned Black Panther and the Crew, and that was canceled after its second issue. Oh. Okay. Even before it was able to make its numbers, and that was in July. Okay. But I'm just saying it was canceled right after that. Okay. So it was ordered, and there's um, they based the second issue numbers, um, and said, oh, it's not popular. We're going to cancel it. But at the same time, Snot Girl, yes, there's a comic called Snot Girl, and yes, that is her superpower. Had, had less numbers. Actually, I think she had about 300 less numbers. Bless you. I don't have it in front of me, but I remember looking at these, this. And she had her first week. Her first month was good. Her second month was on par with the crew, but they were like, "No, no, no, we're gonna let this go for a full twelve issue run." Who's the publisher? It's not girl. Yeah. I think it's uh. IDW. Yeah, I need to check. Hang on, I'll find out for you. Um, well, do we but, really want to know? Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, in comparison, it's, it's Image. I'm sorry, it's Image. Right. Right. So, image. so, the, the, the so no, yeah. But the other thing that I want to point out is. Sometimes, and this is a good point though, Image many times will let, even if the numbers aren't great, they'll let a full 12 inch issue run go and they're considered indie, whereas Marvel or DC won't. Um, and so that's the, that's the other issue. And then also mm -hmm. it's about pre-orders. And a lot of people don't pre-order their comics. It's, it's very hard to explain, and I have like an extensive post about this on my site, about how to order pre-order comics. But it's very hard to tell people 
go to a comic store or call a comic store and pre-order a comic that hasn't that won't come out for 30 days and then go back and pick it up when I can have McDonald's delivered. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm just saying, like, I can order from Amazon Prime at 6 o'clock in the morning and it's on my doorstep. But we're still using an antiquated system where we have to pre-order. And I'm not against it. I'm just saying it has to be updated. And this is... And, I asked about the digital numbers because many times digital numbers aren't counted. Mm -hmm. No, and that's a yeah, not, not in this town. Right. So the audience would know. So that's the only thing I want to. Sorry, what was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> oh, the numbers. Okay. Yeah, the numbers. Well, you're not, you you are you're distributed. He's distributed by Diamond. So this is a good question to ask. What happens yeah. if you don't pre-order? <laughs> yeah, I mean, she's right. The, the system. I usually am. <laughs> the system, I, I, I agree with you, I think the system needs to be updated. Um, like you said, we live in a world now where you can watch an entire season of House of Cards on, on Netflix. Like, you know, everyone wants things, you know, immediately and they, they want it in bulk and they want things like fast and quick. So trying to tell someone to, like you said, you know, okay, 30 days before I'm going to pre-order that, I'm going to come, like, it's, it's very hard. And for me, like, honestly, I don't, I don't really care about the numbers, um, especially when it comes to the other guys. Other guys, other guys. yes, because, I, like I said, I think a lot of the, a lot, a lot of the, the, the stress and emotion and energy we all use to question things are the, other, other guys, guys do. I, I think a lot. I think a lot of that can be uh, can be put towards supporting the independent um, publishers as well too. And again, not just supporting for supporting sake. There's a, there's a ton of content. There's a ton of great things that people are doing that you can actually put your money towards. And like she said, there's digital. Uh, you know, people are selling you know through things like peep game comics. Like there's things out there where if you want truly diverse content that like she said, people actually put their heart into. Mm -hmm. It's out there for for you to support right now. Like. I, I don't I don't I don't mind us like she said com I mean not necessarily I, I don't like the word complain like we can constructively criticize and try to open a debate where we can challenge the other guys or whatever the case may be but at the same time like a lot of times we miss we we'll miss the point of action when it comes to this industry there's a lot of talk there's a lot of talk 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 and no action there's stuff out there that is diverse, that is great quality, yep. it's exactly what you're looking for. Just go out there and make the effort. So for me, I can't necessarily, and, and there's also marketing that goes into that as well too. Like, I don't know how many of those diverse contents are really being pushed the way the other ones are. Yep. Um, you know, so the numbers to me, like, it, I mean, yes, we can debate about that. I just, I just really don't care about that. I just feel like a lot of energy is put too, too, too much on trying to figure out what the other guys are doing where it can be focused on, you know, just supporting great content that you like, that you want, that you want to see. Because if you want to see more diverse stuff, you have to, you have to uplift the ind independent community. Because that's the only way that people like us can keep on producing this quality content on a consistent, consistent basis. Marvel, DC, Image, they all started. The other guys, I'm sorry, they all started from somewhere, and they are what they are today because we supported them. So the same thing can happen for other stuff that you like. And speaking from that on a business standpoint, please uh, let them know the diverse products that everyone here uh, is, has. Um, speak to your product real quick, please. Um, I make the comic uh, Malice in Ovenland. It's a fantasy adventure comic about a young girl who ends up getting more than she bargained for when she finds herself wishing for summertime fun uh, when she's stuck in like a sea of chores and she ends up in a whole other world. I also do a comic called The Anansi Kids and the All Saints Day Adventure. It takes place in the West Indies and um, it celebrates Caribbean folklore. And uh, that's all for now. Um, so I have four graphic novels out right now. Um, I mentioned them earlier. EXO, The Legend of Wally Williams is a superhero sci-fi that takes place in a futuristic Lagos, Nigeria where I was born and raised. The second book is Malaika Warrior Queen. It's a historical fantasy that takes place in a 15th century West Africa. So you get to see what Africa looked like in the 15th century and how an African queen ruled the empire and defended it against threats, both inside and, and uh, internal and external uh, of the empire. The, the, the third graphic novel is The Windmaker, and uh, that's it's it's a uh, it's a com it's a two it's it's a combination between an art book and a story book, and it, it's actually inspired heavily by West African mythology. 
I also have uh, Malaika One Shot that's coming out for Halloween Comic Fest, so please go out and support your local comic book store. It's going to be for free as well as uh, a ton of other free stuff on Halloween Comic Fest, October 28th. Um, I have several books. I have two with me, um, but if you want to check them out, we're uh, Richelieu and I are at booth 341. Um, the first book is Eating Vampires, and that's about a young girl who's the last of her people and the only cure for a vampire virus outbreak for those in the back that can't see. And uh, I have Ice Witch. Ice Witch is about an assassin. She gets married, has a child. Now the company's after her baby. <laughs> Bad chicks, man. <laughs> Um, all right, so I do a comic called Bounce, for those of you who can't see, right? It is basically, about, I worked as a bouncer in New York for about um, 12 years, and I have a lot of stories about drunk people. In <laughs> <laughs> and, and every time I would tell them a story about what I went through the night before, I'm like, yo, you should really write about that, man. And I'm like, nah, ain't nobody want to hear that shit. But, oh, sorry. Dude. <laughs> uh, we're, we're rated R here. I don't think oh, you have okay. Oh, you I don't see any little ones. You no, know. I do see one little one. I'm oh, sorry. Okay. PG 13. Uh, yeah, PG 13 in the back. Alright, don't the ears. We're going to bleep that out on the uh, edit of the film. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, we'll take that out. Yeah, we'll take that out. That's what, that's, what, that's what bar life does to you. But um, basically, the story revolves around the dude who calls himself the bouncer. Since I'm such a huge Doctor Who fan, call him like the doctor, the bouncer. Um, he has this little thing called the time nullifier that allows him to travel between time and space, uh, only between bar bathrooms. Though, so. <laughs> he has to get really drunk before he does it. So the, the, the entire comic is it's a comedy, a slice of life kind of thing. Each uh, strip is a standalone strip. Sometimes they come together and it's like a little bit of a saga. You know, you got one where a dude's trying to take over the bar, or you got. I, I'm currently working on a story right now where the bouncer versus the quote unquote uh, alt right or the, the Proud Boys or whatever. So it's like there's a, a alt right bar that opens up across the street. Now they have to go up against this opposing force or whatever. But yeah, it, it's just it's. Your basic cheers means family guy means Rick and Morty, but black people. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm the blur girl and I make noise. Yeah. Yeah. So she, she, she brings all these people together, right? So a lot of you follow the blur girl. You know, bring us all out here. Um, and she talks about, uh, she don't like to say diversity, but she talks about diverse content um, and just not the other guys and everything. Even though she does speak about the other guys too. She does reviews on them too. And, uh, once again, my name is Nasi Gifted. I actually have a product called uh, PB Soldier. It's a, um, it's a sci fi adventure set in the near future where we live in a world where everyone's considered a terrorist. Um, the main character, PB Soldier, is a hacker who, um, who actually sees visions of a life that's not of his own. And while he sees these visions, um, he's questioning his own sanity. And that's kind of like where the whole adventure starts from. So the reason that you know we, we even come together is we talk about you know you're here because you want to see diverse products. And the thing is, we have diverse products, but will you support it? And when we talk about supporting, you know that means you actually have to go to Booth 341. You actually have to go to Booth uh, 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 1267 where me and Roy. One two six seven. Yeah, one two six seven where uh, me and brother Roy is at, and um and I believe. Uh, Brother Chuck, he, he he's here all day, you know. Um, I'm not sure. Are you with a booth somewhere? No, no. I'm I'm just I'm I'm just. Well, he's just here, but you can find Chuck though. You gonna find out how you can find each and every he's single one of these people. He's drinking whiskey, walking up and down. <laughs> 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 trying to find a bathroom to get to the next convention. It's early. I haven't started yet, but let's believe some some point some whiskey will be. Here we go. And, and if you see a bar fight, just know that Chuck will be writing about it later on. I probably, I probably started it. <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna open, uh, we're gonna open this panel up for questions. We have a mic over here. If you have any questions, you can come right here. Or if you have uh, your teacher's voice or whatever, you can yell it out. We could be able to go from there. All right. Uh, we have uh, our brother in the blue right here. Can you go ahead? Okay. I'll use my teacher's voice. So. Uh, how do you deal with writing for others, um, say like differently abled people, LGBTQ people, other races? And I have another question just back after that. It's like, do you compare your work to the other guys or other works that could possibly discourage you from doing that? Um, do it, it, is that 
there was something I was going to say about the first question that you asked about um, before, and I totally forgot that point about writing for other people. Uh, I believe that if you do create content that involves someone, especially that lives differently than you, did, you know, you have, like, I, I can't uh, speak as a black woman in America because I'm not a black woman. So if not. exactly, so I mean, uh, and I'll be completely honest. Like, if if I'm gonna write an in-depth story where the black woman is the main character, I'd rather just get a black woman writer. I'll tell them, you know, hey, you know, I got this idea, but run with it. Tell it from your perspective. But I feel like that that should be the staple for anything, whether you're telling the story from the perspective of a black woman, black man, LGBT, LGBTQ, anything. You have to be able to say, I don't, if I don't know about that life, either I will get extremely educated about it or I'll hire someone <laughs> from that life to write the story that I want to um, tell. Um, as far as, uh, the, what was your second question? It was about the... Uh, compare, just comparing your work to like other, other works or other people's. Well, I, I think, in all honesty, it, 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 you you kind of lose yourself and, and the original point of whatever you're creating if you consistently try to compare yourself. Mm -hmm. Like, I can't compare my comic to something that the other guys do because it's not what they do. But I've spent a lot of time trying to craft the property itself, so I think, I think every artist, originally when you were a kid, your point was to create something, not to be like something to make something that came from here. And I think somewhere along the line, people lost that. And I think either they saw something that they really liked, you know, or they wanted to be like, oh, I want to be like the guy who made Superman, or the guy, his success, the guy who made uh, Spider-Man or whatever. And, and you kind of lose yourself in actually making a story that can touch other people the same way those characters touched you. So I think as a creator, and especially being independent, it is way important for you to keep creating content <coughs> that speak to other people, but that's not like anything else out there. That's, that's just me. So did you, um, you, you mentioned something about discouraged, without getting discouraged. I wanted to understand what you meant by that. Um, did you say something about without getting discouraged? Yeah, just with, like when you're, when you're writing something, yeah. like I, I write a lot of story concepts and things, um, and I've been working on my own comics, so I worry sometimes when I compare my, mm -hmm. my comic ideas right. to like something else. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, um, I mean, I think what Chuck said is, is excellent, but I mean, it, it's okay to, um, to, to look at um, whether that's the other guys or who, I mean, other people, your peers, and be inspired by what they're doing and their achievements and want to be able to push yourself to be able to get to a point where you're getting better every day. Um, but, you know, like, I don't think, um, I think telling your own story in your own unique way, whatever that, that may be, is what you should always hone yourself to and a lot of times as, as creators, I know I've been there as well, it's like especially when, when you want to start, you look at the models and you see, you see how far they are and you're like, man, where do I even start or do I even have any hope of getting anywhere close or making an impact? You always have to remember, um, even Walt Disney started with just Mickey Mouse, right? That's, that was the first thing he created. Like, he wasn't thinking about theme parks and, oh, I want to be able to have this and this in, in 40 years or whatever the case may be. He had that idea and that's what he ran with. And now, you know, Disney is arguably one of the biggest creative companies that exists today. So you always have to focus on, you, it's okay to have a vision, but just focus on your story because no one, and when I say your story, I mean you, not necessarily what you're writing. No one has your life experiences, everything that you've been through, um, your growing up, your background, whatever the case may be, that's what makes you unique. So you always have to lean on that and be able to, you know, look at yourself in a way that, okay, there's a place I want to get to, but it's actually a journey that I have to go through. And just because I'm not there yet, or I'm not where this person is or that person is, doesn't mean that you have to look down on yourself. Let it inspire you to actually get up every day, do something about it, and just make yourself better. Um, how many aspiring writers are in the audience? If you know, about raise their hands real quick. Wow, we got a lot of inspiring writers. So, uh, brother Roy was just talking about, you know, you know, find your niche, right? And and then when you find your niche, own it. You, that's that's what we need you to do. We need you to own it because nobody does tell a story like you do, the way you do it, and everything. And then there's going to be a market that's going to be tied into that niche. You just got to be able to find that market, you know. 
Don't try to craft your story like someone else's, because then it's not yours, then it's someone else's. You know, it's got to be your own story. It's got to be your own unique thing. Um, with that, uh, we have another question. Oh, we have another question. Yes, we do. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't even see it at the poll. Go ahead. Um, so, I this is a question oh. for all the panelists. So, how do you Someone who's a person of color or someone who happens to not be Caucasian. This book is for children. Yeah, that's why. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you are absolutely right. No, no, it's okay. No, it's okay. But you are absolutely right. Um, everybody is so busy trying because we're in the age now of making comics for movies mm -hmm. and for hitting the the millennial market that people have forgotten that there are books out there for children. There are also a lot of the TPBs, which are trade paperbacks, like um, Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur, like Miss Marvel, are actually being picked up and sold as books not in the graphic novel section because they are selling well for kids. And I tell, I've talked to people all the time that will go, well, what do, what do we, you know, how do I get my book in front of kids? And I'm like, well, it, is it for that age group? And they go, yeah, like, but I'm trying to get it into a comic book shop. I'm like, why? You need to get it in front of children. Mm -hmm. They're like, well, it, how? And I'm like, ask a seven-year-old whether or not it's a graphic novel or a kid's book. Yeah. You know what I mean? There's seven. If it's a comic or if it's an image that they like, they'll read it. But Micheline needs to talk about her book. <laughs> yeah, um, I created Malice in Ovenland to address that very thing. Um, also because I'm basically like a 12-year-old and a great big older Slightly older. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, like I was saying in the beginning, I used to go to comic stores with my brother, and I would never see anything like that was that was speaking directly to me. So it's something that I, you know, myself is, think is very important because it's, it, kids need to see themselves mirrored in the adventures and things like that. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah, it's something I enjoy doing a lot. Uh, taking all the elements of things as a kid that I love so much: Saturday morning cartoons, video games junk food, time with friends, summertime, like all that stuff. And it's, I guess, kind of a love letter to all of that. But yeah, there are women out there who are doing, uh, I think there's some more women, women in comics that are doing stuff for kids, no? Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Um, Sarah Gomez Woolley, um, Laura Alvarez, um, I think, wasn't Jennifer working on uh, Jennifer Fute for Kelly until this month? Uh, I think so. Yeah, oh, Jennifer, so. Jennifer Fute. <laughs> Oh my gosh, the list goes on and on. There's so many women, but yeah, there's a huge, there's a huge, there's a huge market for it, and there are um, creators creating it, but a lot of it is on the indie scene. Yes, and while you're here, also check out the small press section um, because I took a gander yesterday, and there's a lot of kids' books in there this year. Mm -hmm. So anybody who has a child who's looking for books for them, check out small press. All right, before we just jump into the next question, thank you. Uh, that's actually Ashley Taylor. She's a uh, yes. she's an illustrator herself. Yes, she is. Yeah, yes, she is. Thanks. She was at Cape Fest last year. Yeah. 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 Um, there was a other guy who actually slipped in on the panel. I want to introduce him real quick. Uh, Brother Delante, Brother Delante Bass. Uh, he just slipped in. Just introduce yourself real quick before we get to the next question. Peace, how's everybody doing? My name is Delante J. Bass, aka Brother Sunflower. Um, I'm the marketing director at PBS Media, represent PB Soldier, the graphic novel. So, apologize for being late, but you know how New Jersey Transit is. <laughs> so, that's about it. <laughs> All right, your question, please. Um, so, obviously, I'm not a person of color, so my question is actually paraphrased for something I've heard a Chinese Canadian friend talk about a lot. And that is, what is the Can you step closer to the mic? Sorry. Yeah. Sure. Make sure we hear it. Is it better? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, it's thank working. You. All right, so, should I repeat what I said earlier? Yes, please. Okay. So obviously I'm not a person of color, uh, and so my question is actually paraphrased from something that I've heard a Chinese-Canadian friend talk about a lot, um, and that's sort of intercommunity community dynamic, 
uh, intercommunity dynamics. So the thing that this friend has said is that a lot of the time people use uh, diversity to mean white people and then black and brown people and have a tendency to forget uh, people of indigenous descent, people of Asian or South Asian descent, and so on. So how do you guys handle with when somebody points out that you might have been missing a group because it's just not necessarily something that crops up in your daily life or whatever? Um, I'll address this because I actually have to address this on a, I address on a pretty regular basis. Okay. You're absolutely right. Um, and I talk a lot about how we, everybody's using the word diversity, and that's not necessarily what they mean. Um, they mean, hey, I want you to take a look at my work and things that mean ref and reflect me, whoever that me is. You are absolutely correct that when um, diversity is not just black or brown people, and you're right, the most, pop the most obvious one that comes to mind is the Oscar So White controversy. For some reason, that Oscar So White, for some reason, just meant there's not enough black people. And then they, they weren't, no one was talking about Latinx, no one was talking about Chinese, Korean, Japanese, no one was, no one was even distinguishing between that. Um, no one was talking about, you know, LGBTQ, no one was talking about disabled, no one was talking about Romani, or, or um, even um, Inuit, no one was discussing those, because, the, because I think to mainstream, those look like subsets, so you're absolutely right. What we are stuck in is basically, uh, when we're talking about diversity and having these conversations, we actually need to define them, because mainstream defines it as, hey, it's not a white guy, and there's so much more to it than that. Like even on this panel, like someone mainstream might come up and say, "Oh, it's all black people," but we got Haitian, Bermudian. I'm um, from Egypt. You know, there you go. Like that's what I'm saying. We have, you know, African. Like so, there are subsets and um, within all of these. And I think when it's pointed out, I usually, like I just did, say, "You're absolutely right." let me explain what I mean when I say diversity in this conversation. So I think it's important, and I'm just saying from a blogger's perspective and a writer and a journalist, that when you are describing something or a situation and you're saying this is about a diverse topic, you need to define the parameters of that diversity. Because otherwise you're gonna get dragged up and down Twitter. <laughs> well, I just wanted to add to that. I mean, in terms of, I'll speak in terms of the Women in Congress organization. When we're talking about diversity, we're talking about rep rep representation, and I often say what is normal as me, a, me as a New Yorker walking down the street for the people that I see. When we have panels, our panels reflect our membership, and our membership is a coalition of ethnic women from around the world. So for us personally, it's about representation, whatever that might mean to, to you, whether it's LGBTQ, black, white, um, East Asian, South Asian, um, North American, <coughs> South American, Latin American. Um, we just have that breadth of the membership sitting on the panel, so that's how we do it. Oh, you know, I want to add, sometimes when we talk about diversity, you got to look at the writer's background. Not everybody's that deep. Not everybody's really thinking that far when they're writing. Because if you talk about Japan animation and animation, it's all Asians. And you know, sometimes as a writer, he writes about what's in the surrounding. If I live in an area that's pre predominantly Asian, and I'm Asian, nine times 10, I'm a write based on the Asian background. So sometimes we're asking people to do something that they may not be thinking about. You know, so sometimes you have to bring that to them. And when I say, like for me, I live in a predominantly black neighborhood. So everything I do, everything I embellish is black. So, you know, I may see Caucasians, white people, I may see Asians, but that's not my story. So, you know, also you gotta, like she said, divine diversity. So for my story, it is seeing me, it is seeing reflection. So sometimes you have to look at the writer who's writing the story and what's their background. Okay. Uh, anybody else want to, oh, we have another question. I think this will be the last question and we'll kind of start wrapping up. Go ahead. Right. Hello. Hello. Yep, sorry. Yeah. Um, I was wondering how social media and the internet and, and you know, like, how that helped getting your work out and things like that. 
Like, how does how did social media and the internet help project your voices? Oh, wow. Okay, I'll do this one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I was going to tag it. Oh, no, go ahead. You can start. Go ahead. They turn nothing. I mean, um, most people here are here because of some type of social media aspect, right? Uh, you probably follow one or a couple of the individuals up here just because of social media, because we never got a chance to meet physically. So the, the internet and social media has allowed us to be able to reach global um, aspects of individuals who, you know, we wouldn't be able to touch on a local level. Uh, and then I kind of just pass it over to the blurred girl. <laughs> um, okay, so if you, I, I don't know if you're an artist or a writer, if you're an artist, you need to be on Instagram, like yesterday. And you need to be, be putting your images up and you need to tag them with not just your name but also the, the subject matter and, and things like that. There's also, there's ways to basically make your stuff very searchable very quickly on Instagram and that is not just putting hashtags in your um, in your uh, caption, you can put up to 21 um, hashtags in your comment. So basically post, put your pertinent information in the in the caption and then put up to 21 per um, pertinent. Uh, don't put like Toys R Us, you know what I mean? Like put like stuff that's pertinent to what you're doing um, in your comic. Now if you're, um, if you should also. You can also be on Facebook and do the same thing. Never post on Twitter without an image. Um, if you're trying to tell somebody about your art, don't say, "Hey, I have a comic," and don't put a link and don't put an image. I can't tell you how many people hit me up like, "Yo, look at my work." I'm like, "Where's the link?" <laughs> um, also, um, make listen and read and look at other hashtags and other feeds. There are a lot of Facebook groups. Be careful, especially as a sister. Be careful. Don't join all of the ones, especially about arts and comics. They are not all black, female friendly. I will talk yeah. to you personally afterwards if you like some specifics. Um, but be sure to get involved in somebody's group. Um, also, uh, look for Twitter conversations. Uh, every Sunday, um, there's comic book hour. Hashtag comic book hour, if you want to look for it, just literally you can look for hashtag comic book hour. And it's all independent comic of people talking about their comics and it is a place where pe the first question is who are you and what do you do so if you're one of those people who are like oh I don't like really being silly I don't really like talking about my stuff and it's not just by comics it's comics for the guy that runs it is lives in London it's from all over the world so yes and a lot of people and artists and bloggers and even publishers look at that feed so again introduce yourself obviously put your art up also talk about your stuff and, but um, don't get in the habit of just adding, like hitting at and like don't at Obama. You know what I mean? Like don't at, like don't at Oprah and think, oh, I'm gonna get put on. That's not how it works. Sorry, and can can I also, okay. real quick, it's important, this is how important it is. Me and my partner, sometime we'll be in another city or state and somebody will come up to us and say, I know you, and you look, I don't know you, man. But you gotta play it off, like, word, I know, where I know you from? And they like, yeah, I saw your, your page up, I, I follow you, I follow you. And the important thing is consistency. Every Wednesday, he posts the page up of our comic book. Consistency, this has been going on for about, what, two, three years? Every Wednesday, never miss a beat. And then the thing about how important social media is very important. The thing is, you want to also post pictures of, of not just your comic book, but actually people buying your comic book, buying your work. So they see you got to support a strong base. And also, everything's not always a comic book thing. We also post pictures of us up at the Comic Con. <laughs> and then put a thousand hashtags on it. So now people will follow you just because they feel you're somebody and you're going places. You know, you follow people that's doing things. So you have to show that you're doing things with your comic book, with your artwork. And therefore people say, oh, that's a person worth knowing. So these are some of the things you have to think about, you know, but consistency, yeah, consistency, yeah. consistency. Um, just re very quick, um, don't don't get caught up with likes. Um, that's something that I always have to tell myself every day, even till now. Um, 
you know, whether you get one or a thousand, like that's that's something that you have to be very careful about because a lot of times we get carried away with the amount of likes and we use that to validate ourselves. So please just don't get caught up. It's it's a good marketing tool, but don't just don't get caught up in the number of likes that you get. Can, can I just say one thing real quick? I know we're almost done, but um, social media also gives you the platform to to interact directly with fans. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't have continued doing this like is much like you said consistency. I put out a comic three times a week for three years straight. Because this year has been a little rocky, but. Um, being able to see the fans' reaction is what made me be able to move forward and continue to post more and create more content because of their reaction to it. If it wasn't for them, I wouldn't even continue with this. So it gives you that connection to your fans to actually speak to them and to you know hook it up. So that's that's all I got. All right, we got the uh, the official wrap up sign. So real quick, can you just give everyone your, how can they reach you? And uh, we thank you. Uh, we'll be right outside there if you want to talk to us more. Um, I know me and Roy are at booth uh, 1267. Um, Regine and Micheline is at uh, three, 341. 341. So you can actually see us at our booths. But um, go ahead and just give your social media real quick and uh, we'll wrap it up, please. Uh, ovenlandcomic.com or Instagram ovenlandcomic. Um, at Unique Studios, Y O U N O E K Studios. The Blurred Girl, T-H-E-B-L-E-R-D-G-U-R-L, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat. YouTube. Uh, Twitter, at Women in Comics, NY. Uh, on Instagram, uh, W-N-C, N-Y-C. At Bounce Comic, at, I'm sorry, at Bounce underscore comic on both Twitter and Instagram, uh, Facebook as well, and BounceTheComic.com. PBSoldier.com and at PBSoldier on all the social media thing. Uh, I thank you all for coming um, and yeah. spending this time with us. And appreciate you. Thank you for being an attentive audience. Thank you for uh, supporting the other guys, but now we need you to support us. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to say.